Hello, and thank you for joining us for the third in our webinar series that's celebrating the 50th anniversary of the National Center for Higher Education Management Systems, or NCHEMS. These webinars are hosted by NCHEMS staff members who have specific expertise in higher education issues and practices. And today we're featuring NCHEMS' own Peter Ewell as he and his guests look at defining and measuring quality in higher education. Can we go to the next slide? Thanks. I am Sally Johnstone, president of NCHEMS. And before I turn this over to Peter, let me explain our format. We will be listening to the panelists discuss a set of issues for the first part of this webinar. Then we'll ask them to respond to your questions. I am also joined today by two of my colleagues here at NCHEMS, Sarah Torres Lugo, who will monitor the questions that you want to ask the panelists, and Liz Weeks, who will be running the webinar. To pose a question or a comment, would you please click on the Q&A in the controls? If you're in a full screen mode, you might need to hover your mouse over the screen to make the controls visible. Once you click on Q&A, a window will appear. Type your question in the text field and then click send to submit it. If you want to pose a question to a specific panelist, please make sure to begin your question with the name of that panelist. The chat will not be monitored, so please use only the Q&A function. All right, let me turn this over to Peter to get us going. Thanks, Sally, and let me repeat the welcome to all of you who are, are joining us on this webinar. I've had a quick look at the uh, at the uh, respondent list, and there are probably 27, 28 of you, and uh, uh, it uh, it's a very diverse group, uh, and uh, I I think that it will ensure a lively discussion when we get to that. Uh, let me introduce our uh, my fellow panelists uh, as the first thing to do. Uh, we have George Ku, who is the founding director of the uh, one of the founding directors of the National Institute for Learning Outcomes Assessment, fondly known as NILOA, uh, with the, the emphasis on a kind of Hawaiian lilt to that. Uh, you may know George uh, uh, formally uh, as the director of NESI, the National Survey is student, Survey of Student Engagement, uh, and he is also Chancellor's Professor uh, of Higher Education at Indiana University at Bloomington. Uh, Melanie Booth is Associate Vice President at Dominican University. Uh, when I invited her to join this panel, though, uh, she was working with the Quality Assurance Commons, uh, the QAC, uh, and before that was a, uh, a staff member, senior staff member at the WASC uh, Senior Commission, uh, one of the uh, regional uh, accreditors. Uh, that said, uh, if we could turn to the central themes uh, slide, um, let me go over what we intend to uh, to talk about today. I, I want to start a little bit with uh, the vexed question of what is quality. And it's a question that's asked in lots of different uh, venues and ways. Uh, and there are different definitions and different approaches that have come in over time, which I'll return to in a minute. But let me just cut the, to the other three uh, uh, topics that we're going to deal with. Uh, a central core concern uh, is the dichotomy, if it is a dichotomy, between accountability and improvement, uh, which is a theme that has kind of uh, been present in this conversation since the very beginning and continues to be attention today. Uh, we're then going to turn largely under George's leadership uh, with uh, considering what institutions are doing these days with regard to accountability and particularly with regard to student learning uh, assessment uh, based upon uh, the sets of surveys of provosts that the National Institute uh, for Learning Outcomes Assessment, NILOA, has been doing uh, since the very beginning uh, and uh, tracking the, uh, the trends in that, that data. Uh, and we're going to conclude basically with uh, some uh, considerations of accreditation as a stimulus and a constraint on what we do uh, in this area, uh, a, a set of, uh, of 
topics that Mel will uh, generally lead us through. Now, let me cons return to the what is quality uh, kind of thing. It's interesting to look at historically uh, something that, uh, that I've done uh, here and there uh, in several publications. Uh, and the, the notion of quality in higher education was very much taken for granted until about the end of the, uh, the 19th century when the accrediting commissions uh, began considering it uh, explicitly. Uh, but there have been a set of very different views or definitions of quality uh, that kind of layer in on top of one another over time. And you'll find them familiar, but the, the ones that, uh, that uh, were true at the beginning never really go away. And in many ways uh, re remain quite dominant. Uh, one is reputation, uh, really that uh, uh, the, the best institutions are the ones that I've heard of uh, or that, uh, that, that make, the, make the news. Uh, uh, bound in with that is the notion of resources. A quality institution is one that has a lot of stuff. Uh, it's got a lot of money. Uh, it's got good facilities, et cetera, et cetera. And you see that, uh, interestingly enough, uh, actually uh, featured in some of the early accreditation work. Uh, selectivity is bound up with that. Uh, the, the, the best institutions are the ones that have the highest standards uh, for admission. Uh, and then uh, an, another different interpretation comes in uh, around the uh, uh, 40s and 50s, uh, which the Brits would call fitness for purpose, that a quality institution is one that fulfills its mission and fulfills it very well. And then uh, beginning uh, in the early 80s, we have uh, the current concern with student outcomes, with outcomes uh, as a uh, uh, the central arbiter of, of quality, which is now embedded in regional accreditation. Uh, uh, standard for all of the uh, of the seven commissions. Let me move on uh, to a brief look at history, uh, the origins of the uh, what's become called the assessment movement uh, in the uh, uh, in the 1980s. Uh, it begins with a series of uh, undergraduate reform reports uh, that themselves were stimulated in many ways uh, by a nation at risk, which was uh, uh, to do with uh, with uh, K-12 education uh, in 1983. Uh, and uh, uh, th those uh, a set of reports really uh, set the uh, the tone of, of what happened uh, next, and it's really two different things. There's an internal stimulus of a call for more coherent teaching and learning approaches and information to improve them. Two reports characterize that uh, involvement in learning, uh, the NIE report of 1984, and integrity in the college curriculum. Uh, by the Association of American Colleges in 1985. This was before they got their U. So it's uh, the organization which is now AAC and U. Uh, it's interesting, I, I, I always go back to involvement in learning once a year, almost ritualistically, to take a look at what it said. And it's amazing, and I would recommend that to anybody. Uh, if you can find a dog-eared copy of involvement in learning, uh, take a look at it, because the kinds of things which it, uh, it talks talks about uh, as the determinants of undergraduate quality are as fresh today uh, as they were when it was written uh, all those years, uh, years ago. But at the same time, or just a little later, there was an external stimulus, uh, stakeholder demands for information on return on investment. And the, the report that symbolizes that uh, was one by the National Governors Association, a sort of revealingly titled Time for Results. Uh, and while that wasn't exclusively devoted to higher education, it did call on in education, higher education institutions uh, to be held accountable uh, for student learning, student learning outcomes. And that was the origin of some of the early state mandates in the late 1980s. Uh, states like Colorado, Virginia, South Carolina uh, passed laws uh, to require public institutions to report on student learning. And by the 1990s, uh, the accreditors had taken up that call uh, and th these calls for measuring student learning, if you will, were embedded in regional accreditation standards uh, from the 1990s uh, forward. Now, if you look at those two uh, uh, trends, the internal and the external, there have been tensions and motive in motive and message ever since. That's been true of assessment and accountability since the uh, very beginning. Next slide, please. 
Um, and so that leads to our basic uh, dichotomy uh, that uh, that we're going to consider a little bit. The two kinds of uh, of views uh, of assessment: one from the point of view of the outside, where assessments are intended primarily to check up on institutional and program performance, uh, and the contrasting view. Uh, is scholarship and continuous improvement, where assessments are intended primarily to provide feedback on collective performance for the purposes of improvement. And that can be applied at any level of analysis, institution, program, uh, state, uh, but it also can be applied not only to student outcomes, but to lots of other uh, things that uh, might be counted as accountability as well. Expanding that a little bit in the next slide, um, this is this shows a kind of uh, taxonomy of of how the uh, difference between continuous improvement and accountability can be played out in almost every dimension uh, of the way in you way in which you use uh, and present information uh, from the purpose of this from formative uh, to summative uh, and and with terms of, uh, of instrumentation, uh, accountability tends to look at standardized statistics that are comparative. Uh, the data are quantitative, uh, whereas uh, uh, continuous improvement may use lots of different methods, and the data are both qualitative and uh, quantitative. Uh, and uh, the communication of results may be in the uh, improvement sense, lots of different channels, uh, and in accountability thing, public uh, and essentially with a certain amount of gotcha uh, associated with it. Now we can play with this a lot. Uh, this original uh, diagram was most uh, closely uh, uh, featured uh, in a paper I wrote, uh, the, it was the original occasional paper number one for NILOA uh, back in 2009. Uh, and George Koo, uh, who'd taken the helm of that uh, at that time, asked me to write that paper. And uh, I told him, George, you know, I wrote that paper a dozen years ago. And he said, well, write it again. And so I ended up doing that. Uh, but uh, this is basically, uh, there's a lot in this diagram uh, that you can see uh, contrasts the two approaches. Let me uh, pause here and uh, ask uh, George uh, first, uh, and then Mel, uh, if you have any reactions or additional things that this triggers that you'd like to say. This is George, and he says hello to everybody who's uh, participating in this. And uh, yes, I asked Peter to uh, expand on uh, this uh, dichotomy, this template, uh, because he was about the only person I knew who could. Now, he and I have had some uh, discussions about whether these are uh, essentially independent tracks uh, running parallel or whether, in fact, uh, we can find a way to bend them so they intersect more often. Uh, we might talk about that. Later, one of the things that we're likely to underemphasize because our focus here today is, I think, primarily on student learning outcomes, um, is that metric that swamps all of this discussion in the popular uh, media, and that is uh, completion rates. Uh, I mean, we could put this on the chart, uh, certainly, but uh, there's too little talk, it seems to me, uh, in various places outside of the academy. Uh, uh, about things that also matter. A graduate, you know, one has to graduate. To not, well, one doesn't have to, but as Bob Pace once said, the longer one is in school, the more they learn, and that's supposed to. And the completion, baccalaureate certificate, whatever it might be, is to to designate that. I might just uh, also say that you know, one of the reasons I think this dichotomy still holds sway um, is because we failed institutional leaders primarily. Um, in not way, uh, responding to the accountability calls in ways that could we could link to institutional mm -hmm. improvement efforts. I'm not saying this is an easy thing to do, but we uh, historically, uh, certainly since the mid 80s, as Peter introduced the assessment movement, we've tended to uh, reach for tools institutions have that produce information, data that oftentimes were not actionable. Uh, because the tools existed, uh, we bought them often from external uh, providers, if you will, uh, and that led to a host of other kinds of issues that we might get into, including why faculty members were not always keen on seeing themselves and their students 
in those uh, those data. Mel? I, yeah, I, um, hello everybody. And I'd like to underscore something you just mentioned, George, the, the importance of actionable um, and how that genuinely can support uh, faculty um, where the learning happens and, and in their classrooms make improvements and find that a meaningful process and not an administrative process or another thing that has to be done in their day or their month or their or their academic year. And so I, I think that these tensions um, still exist uh, very strongly on campuses. I know um, many directors of assessment and IE folks who uh, float between um, and, and around these intentions for improvement, but also needing to generate reports and explain outcomes. And, um, and so it is a very real set of tensions um, that I think we'll probably continue to, to need to work with it. And I like that idea of kind of how, how, how there might be a third way to bring these together in meaningful ways and actionable ways. Yeah, and I, I think that, uh, you know, classifications or, or things like dichotomies are always a little dangerous because they become mm -hmm. too reified. Uh, mm -hmm. And really, you should think of this as a continuum uh, of emphases that uh, can cut across uh, any assessment method or any set of statistics, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, let's go to the next slide and unpack this a little bit more. Uh, there are some important consequences, we believe, to adopting a largely accountability-based approach. Uh, the first one, is, as is not noted there, that the principal motivation to do this stuff comes from outside the academy in the form of government or accreditation. It's somebody else that's asking you to, uh, uh, to do this. Um, I once, when I, when I was doing a, a project that involved a lot of different levels, uh, tried to determine who somebody else is for any given actor and determined, uh, at least for argument's uh, sake, that it was at least one level above or two levels up in the administrative hierarchy. So for a president, it's the legislature. For the faculty member, it may be a dean. Uh, and so that this, uh, uh, essentially definition of who the other is may depend on where you where you sit. Um, the other thing is that uh, subtly data collection has little to do with the classroom, which is where faculty actually spend their time. Uh, and this is uh, the major ingredient why faculty will increasingly say, this has nothing to do with us. Uh, this is an administrator's responsibility uh, and not something that we really need to pay that much attention to. Somebody will take care of it for us. Next slide, please. There are also some other uh, more technical uh, kind of consequences of adopting uh, an accountability stance. Uh, the, the first is, uh, as I note there, the reification of technique as the mo most important thing about assessment to know and do. Uh, you scratch an assessment professional, and I'm as guilty as that uh, as, uh, as anyone, and we can get very, very quickly into numbers, into technical discussions of what's the instrumentation, What's the validity of it? Uh, what's the, uh, what are the technical properties? Uh, whereas the really important thing is why are we doing this? Uh, what do we hope to find out? And what are we going to, uh, uh, to do with the information? Another thing we see a lot uh, is the prevalence of, of fixed targets. Uh, and central tendency measures in many assessment discussions. Uh, you know, I know they're 75% above X, or the mean score on this particular assessment uh, was uh, was Y, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas the real meaningful information is in the distribution uh, of the data. I mean, what does the first quartile look like? What does the top quartile look like? Who are those people? What are the distinctions and so on? And we really need to get much more sophisticated and rich about looking at the data uh, uh, that is generated by any assessment or accountability uh, measure. A third one which is really important is we don't know a lot about the contexts in which learning takes place. These vary enormously. Uh, we are indebted uh, to instruments uh, like the NESI uh, and, uh, and others like them uh, for information about 
essentially uh, what the student is experiencing. But that's at, at least as important, possibly more important uh, than the actual uh, bottom line, because you can do something about it. You can fix it. Uh, one of the things we learned over many years of practice with the NESI is that people like it because it points to things that you actually might be able to, uh, uh, to do something about. Uh, and a fourth consequence is, uh, and this is largely a uh, product of the accreditation situation, is institutional reluctance to deviate from an assessment plan once they've got it. Uh, that uh, that sometimes maddens the heck out of me when I visit places. Oh no, we can't change that because uh, that's something that uh, North Central is approved or uh, SACS is approved. And uh, even though it may make sense to change it, uh, well, we we don't want to we don't want to uh, deviate from it. Uh, let me again pause and ask uh, if there's any color commentary from George or Mel on this one. <laughs> I have color commentary about the last bullet. <laughs> Peter, um, I I think okay. the assessment plans have um, have in fact um, uh, been proliferated in a way that uh, limits how we really can think about learning in dynamic ways, and um, and that's certainly been my experience of um, uh, regional accreditation, but also programmatic accreditation that calls for uh, approval of these assessment plans and timelines and and um, the processes by which. Um, uh, assessment is completed and evidence is gathered and 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 they become um, almost prescriptive I think and as a result you know we've talked uh, part of the language of assessment is closing the loop closing the loop um, and then you move on to the next thing but uh, it's a question for me around how we really examine if we close the loop in a way that made a difference um, and if we do instead of assessment um, closing the loop if we really think about it as a spiral but assessment plans become so fixed and so scheduled um, for all sorts of good reasons uh, that i think that they can really limit the impact and the actionability um, of of the findings that's my yeah, that, about assessment. No, I think that's a, <laughs> I, I think I think that's uh, that's very helpful. I and I remember vividly. I won't say what region it was in, uh, but a conversation uh, with uh, with institutions around an accreditation context, and uh, I was probing them on what evidence they would use and uh, to to demonstrate uh, accountability for student learning. And you know, they said, well, they won't let us do that. Uh, it was this feeling that the accreditor basically had a n unarticulated set of rules uh, which uh, uh, which dominated the the conversation, and they were scared yeah. to deviate from that. And they were typically things like standardized tests or externally imposing. Mm -hmm. uh, George, any any quick reaction there? Yeah, just just uh, quickly uh, jumping up to the top three on this bullet on this, uh, this set of bullets, top three. We, we've had a tendency, too many institutions still do this, to uh, let the numbers speak for themselves. And now, part of this is, is adding to mm. contextual information, but, you know, Peter, you, you've long reminded me, uh, no number should go unexplained. And we've not done a very good job of that, uh, of telling uh, evidence-based stories that are you know, based on these numbers, but what they represent and what you can conclude and should not ever conclude from the numbers and the displays and measures, uh, various measures. So I, I think we're getting better at that. I know a lot of the NALOA folks I work with are trying now to provide, uh, not scripts, but uh, uh, principles around which we should take the numbers and explain what they mean uh, and what they don't mean. Thanks, George. And uh, in, in, indeed, that's, uh, uh, I, I think my, my actual phrase was beware the unaccompanied number. <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. it was, it, it really is, no number should be uh, uncommented upon. And now that George has the floor, let me leave him uh, uh, with, the, with the mic to take a look at what institutions are doing and how we know. Well, I can't help but say, Peter, the way you've just phrased it has too many passive verbs. But let's move on to the slide. On this slide, uh, uh, you mentioned the Loa, Peter. Thank you. At the outset, uh, Stan Eikenberry, former president of the University of Illinois and American Council uh, on Education, and I uh, uh, it proposed the idea for a national institute uh, that would provide support 
uh, and gather resources, perhaps even develop some, to help institutions uh, document, use, report evidence of student accomplishment. And the motivation, the inspiration, the stimulus uh, for this was uh, the Spellings Commission, which many of us will recall uh, those deliberations in the mid 2000s um, and their uh, their conclusion, which uh, was perhaps to some startling. Uh, but uh, uh, certainly disconcerting to everyone, that we seem to know, that is the enterprise, seem to know precious little about our core business, which was student learning. Uh, and uh, one of the things uh, Niloa intended to do from the outset was to uh, do uh, periodic polling of what was happening on college campuses, at least as far as provosts and directors of assessment could uh, discern with regard to uh, collecting, uh, analyzing, reporting this information. So uh, we did conduct three national surveys, uh, Peter, as you as you mentioned, to, to track the movement over time um, inside colleges and universities with regard to the assessment work they were doing. And our first one was in 2009. We did a second in 2013. Uh, and the most recent data we have is from the 2017 survey as the slide shows. And there are some, I think, uh, uh, helpful, uh, promising signs. For example, that first bullet, um, uh, one of the concerns that we've had about the assessment movement, as we've already mentioned, is that we've tended to collect data that were too far removed from what was actually happening in classrooms, labs, and studios. Well, now we find uh, substantial jumps in what we would call authentic measures uh, uh, in student learning outcomes. Uh, the, the big jump in rubrics, for example, back in uh, uh, 2009, uh, 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 we had right. only about, uh, I don't know, 20% of institutions using rubrics. So now you see that has, uh, has more than, than tripled. Uh, Classroom-based performance measures also up from about 20% from the first survey to now two-thirds uh, of information. So the jump in portfolios. Uh, from 10% back in uh, 09 to now with about a third of the institutions using uh, that kind of uh, authentic measure to assess and, uh, and report uh, what was happening to students and what they can do with what they've been learning. Uh, surveys, however, <laughs> remain prominent. Uh, I guess if you're still uh, in the Nessie work, you're happy about that. You know, about three quarters of the institutions are doing it. And I think uh, Peter, you've already indicated this. Uh, there is uh, keen interest in in the the process indicators, as we call them, not not necessarily the outcome indicators, but the process indicators, because that's where you aim, where you target improvement efforts, right? But there are other kinds of surveys out there. Uh, we, we're we're asking more uh, often from uh, graduates about the quality of their experience, retrospective sense making, uh, notwithstanding. Uh, but employers also. Um, a much more interest in finding out directly from people who are hiring our grads how well we're doing it. We are collecting a lot more information across the board, um, uh, the big jump in the last 10 years, but uh, putting this information to use uh, in a betterment, improvement manner, uh, still remains a, a big challenge, uh, and provosts continue to remind us this. And we've already talked a bit about uh, uh, not just the difficulty, but really the uh, the, the manner in which and the persuasive manner in which we're communicating what we're learning about uh, student learning and what institutions are doing about it to improve these outcomes. And lastly, I'll just say, uh, as that last bullet indicates, it is still the case, whether we like it or not, uh, that without pressure from the regional and specialized accreditors, uh, we probably wouldn't have come nearly this far uh, and, and generating nearly as much information as we are now about the student experience. And so we do have uh, the accreditors to thank for that. Okay, let's um, move on to considering the accreditors directly, Mel. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah. could you clue us in on what they want and what, what they're up to? Yeah, well, one of the things I'd just like to uh, reflect on is, as a segue is that as we've even been having this conversation, we've talked a lot about faculty and what happens in the classroom 
And I think that um, part of the accountability piece and, and paradigm um, has also been that we've privileged curricular learning. Um, and, and it's almost that co-curricular, extracurricular, external prior learning, other sources of learning have almost um, taken a, a back seat. And so I think we're challenged um, um, from an accreditation perspective, but also from a continuous improvement perspective to take that holistic view, um, certainly at the institutional level, but also I think um, within different programs and disciplines, what is the holistic uh, collection of experiences that support student development and learning over time. And so um, I, I, I really think that we're going to um, hopefully start seeing that reflected. I know that there's multiple um, student affairs organizations who are really thinking about, wait, we contribute to this too, and we're and we're developing capacity and tools and interest in in telling that story as well. Um, so getting to accreditation and, and assessment, um, certainly as as George pointed out, um, accreditation regional and programmatic have uh, have really been primary drivers um, of this movement. Um, institutions are free to choose their learning goals, so that's also to a certain extent, um, depending on the programmatic accreditor, um, you know, these processes for identifying your learning goals at the institutional level are embedded in some governance systems. Um, Faculty and staff can identify the ways they want to gather evidence and, and do assessment. There's a lot more focus from accreditation on assessment processes and leadership and capacity. Um, looking at your committee, at your at your resources, at your templates, at your assessment plans, at your curriculum map. Um, you know, there's, there's this proliferation of tools and approaches for this. Even um, my favorite, the meta assessment, like let's assess our assessment, which is all great and good. Um, and uh, rubrics. Um, there's been less focus on results, um, less focus on improvements that are actually tied um, to data. And I think George mentioned that as well from the provost survey. How are we connecting the actual findings to results that we know will work and that we know do work? Um, and so closing the loop uh, is certainly appearing in accreditation language. Um, and again, I'll get back to that idea of how do we know that after we close the loop, the loop is actually um, working <laughs> or that, that intervention or that change is actually accomplished what we have hoped it would. Um, there's been, as well with accreditation, attempts to focus on increasing institutional capacity and not just for assessment, but linking assessment findings strategically to planning, resourcing, um, uh, bringing in data from other sources in the institution, IR and assessment, um, forming groups and alliances now to support a more holistic view. And I think that's um, a good approach um, to, to create that kind of bigger picture. Um, and while, while there has been this increase um, from accreditors to, to really uh, focus on assessment, um, many institutions and programs are not necessarily in trouble with accreditors um, as much for educational effectiveness as they are for other, uh, other areas. Um, I know when I was at WASP, finance and governance um, concerns kind of ruled the list um, over and over of what institutions needed support around. And while educational effectiveness was um, probably third or fourth on that list, um, it, it didn't rise to the level of concern as the other ones did. As many of you know, and as some of you have probably contributed <laughs> to, there's been also a, a growing criticism of accreditation. A lack of transparency um, is one of them. Reports may be available either by an institution or a program buried on some website somewhere. Some accreditors are having reports available. Um, those reports are kept typically full of jargon and they're not necessarily accessible or understandable by a general public. And um, there's also been the concern around the limitations and the challenges of peer review um, and whether or not that's a, a, a good objective uh, approach for um, accreditation to continue. Certainly the level of analysis, um, when a team is sent 
from a, a institutional creditor to look at an institution over three days, and they're looking at everything, um, and they're given reports, uh, data, what we used to call it, WASC data dumps. Don't give us your data dumps. Really help us help us understand your meaning from your data. Um, it, it can be very challenging to to take a granular level view as well as an institutional level view. I think accreditation has also been um, challenged by its um, ability to quickly respond to educational effectiveness concerns and to make them publicly known. Um, and so this kind of slow, slowness to identify these issues and to um, support institutions um, and also hold them accountable has been a critique, as well as, of course, um, a critique around accreditation inhibiting innovation, um, in part because of the speed with which commissions um, uh, review and make decisions, um, and, and um, in part because of the standards themselves and what they require. And so these are some of the criticisms of accreditation. And I think as a result, we were starting to see an emergence of new arbiters of quality. We certainly um, initiated the Quality Assurance Commons um, to address uh, directly an employer-driven and student-informed approach. Um, so, it, you know, we were looking at not just surveys from employers like we, we saw in Georgia's data, um, which is great to have information from employers as part of that mix. Um, but what really were they looking for and what kind of program design, even at the planning stages? Um, there's been other um, uh, groups and organizations and approaches for uh, this kind of, uh, to, to address these concerns with accreditation and to try to promote um, innovation including the EQUIP program um, that was an experimental program out of the Department of Education. And, um, you know, these things kind of are, are, are still, I think, have their feet in the water and they're still um, testing how they can address these quality issues. Um, and I, I really think we will need to um, support these initiatives and, and help m multiple voices come into this conversation about quality um, as we expand it from inside the academy, inside of an institution, to the layers of onions out, uh, the layers of the onion outside of the institution, including kind of our public at large. So I really think that we're going to start seeing that, um, and and that the public is kind of going to demand that um, because of all these concerns um, uh, on accreditors. Mel, thank you. Um, I think we're going to move to questions from the audience at this point. Sarah, do you want to go ahead and moderate that part? Yes, thanks, Sally. So, Mel, this goes in line with what you were just discussing, but maybe we could get some comments from Peter and George and, and you as well, Mel. Um, so, we have a question, and it's, if assessment at the institutional level gets implemented and utilized due to external pressures from accreditors and government, what and who do you feel are the external or internal pressures forcing accreditors and government to push for changes? Well, I'll take a, uh, this is Peter, I'll take a first uh, stab at that. Uh, uh, higher education is no longer operating uh, uh, on its own terms, and that hasn't been true for at least mm -hmm. the past uh, 20 years. I think that the Spellings Commission was a real wake-up call, and uh, uh, it, it, a lot of our responses were, were determined by that, uh, both in terms of the intensity of outside criticism uh, from uh, employers to some extent, uh, uh, not as much as has been has been reported, uh, but uh, from the the public at large, and and it, this mirrors a lot of the K twelve context as well. I, that, that's been true for a long, long time in K twelve. Uh, that there has been an enormous amount of public opinion uh, that say that schools in general are not very good, but my kid's school is just fine. Uh, so it's one of those things where uh, uh, the, it's more of a general public uh, opinion. But we have gone down in higher education uh, in the public's estimation uh, a, a couple of notches in the various uh, Pew opinion polls and things like that across the board. Uh, I'll let uh, uh, other panelists uh, uh, contribute to this. Yeah, 
Well, you've probably heard this phrase before, but but it's the economy, stupid. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, 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 we have taken a big hit in the last 10 years. I, I'm, I'm not trying to be an apologist for high quality across the board, but I don't think, my interpretation is anyway, I don't think we'd be facing the same amount of scrutiny uh, if if it hadn't been so terribly difficult uh, and the constant messages about underemployment of college graduates. I mean, it's bound up in a lot of different stuff. That's a technical term. I mean, the changing nature of the economy itself. But, uh, you know, if you spend a lot of money, uh, you go to college, you're supposed to get a job, which happened to everybody in the 60s, right? Well, it didn't happen <laughs> to everybody in 2007, 8, 9, mm. 10. So I, I, I think uh, in, in direct response to this, I certainly agree with everything Peter said. I always do uh, because he makes sure I do. Uh, I, I do think it's been external pressure, but it's come from a number of different sources. Um, and the media itself has, I don't want to say whipped it into a frenzy because there, there are real issues in terms of lots of people uh, being underemployed. On the other hand, when you ask people, uh, would they do it again? Most say they, the college graduates, most say they would. They might change their major. Finally, um, and I, I can't find this on my fingertips now, but I just read a report the other day where uh, three quarters of institutional leaders and administrators were saying, yes, we should be doing a better job uh, in terms of responding to public uh, requests for information. We should be doing a better job in terms of improving the learning experience. So I think I think institutions now are kind of singing out of the same hymnal, if you will, in terms of what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Greg. I, I, I think, uh, uh, I, let, I let me just make one. Okay. Go ahead, Mel. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I think there's also um, the phrase return on investment that is uh, as, as price, the, the price and cost <laughs> of college um, increases and divest public divestment decreases and we have these tensions around um, students graduating with higher and higher debt and discount rates and all of these financial factors. Um, th this, this idea of I want to make sure my individual child um, or college student or the, the person I'm sponsoring through this program because they're my employee is coming out of that program with the skills, knowledge, and abilities that are expected. And so I think that's a pressure that um, that we're all going to be uh, that we're all feeling as well. Let's get some more questions out there. Yes. Yeah, so Bill Moore's question reads: It strikes me that this discussion is almost exactly the discussion we were having in the 1990s, as I was leading system-wide assessment work in my state. Peter was a keynoter at our initial statewide conference. Why do y'all think so little has changed? And in what ways, if any, do you think the conversation has actually evolved? Uh, hi, hi, Bill. I was glad to, to, to hear you uh, chiming in on this. Uh, I'll take a first crack at that. You're absolutely right. I mean, it is very much the same conversation. I think that partly it's the same conversation because we are constantly socializing new people into this conversation. Uh, uh, there aren't that many uh, like George and Mel and I who've been around sort of from the beginning. Uh, and uh, it, it, bringing new people on board can be a real challenge, particularly at the institutional level. I, I mean, I very much uh, am aware of this, uh, having visited several institutions several times, uh, and uh, someone will come up, uh, and I, I will mention, I was here 10 years ago. Well, a lot of them weren't, <laughs> as it turned out. The faculty were, but a lot of the people participating in the conversation uh, were not, uh, and so it was all it was all new to them. So I think that th these issues never really go away, uh, and we continually revisit them, at least partly because uh, we have to socialize a whole new cohorts of people who have not been part of the conversation. I think the other part of it is that, in some sense, they never do get totally resolved, uh, and uh, we can debate about about that as well. So I'll stop there and give other people a chance. I don't think I have uh, really anything substantive, substantively to add. I do, though, have similar circumstances. Uh, 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 I went to a, a community college uh, twice, uh, one year after the other. Uh, and, and, and neither group seemed to know I was there the year before. So 
when you talk uh -huh. about at the institutional level, Peter, they're, they're often, and some of these places aren't that big, not to be able to, uh, to kind of bring uh, the key players uh, uh, into, uh, into the room. I do think, though, there have been changes. I think we're, we're much better yeah, informed too. about the kinds of um, uh, uh, approaches that will yield information that people can actually use. We don't, all, we don't necessarily do it as well as we could. Uh, we, 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 we don't uh, communicate uh, nearly as well internally as we should, but it's better than it used to be. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's less, a little less apprehension and fear that if we tell somebody else how well we're doing, and certainly every institution has areas where they can improve. I think there's a little less apprehension and fear. I remember when U.S. News published Nessie data uh, from institutions that allowed it to uh, allowed the data to be so made available. None of those institutions closed, and yet there were many that were performing terribly well. I think uh, I think we've made a uh, actually a fair amount of headway, and it sounds to me like uh, Mel wants to chime in here too. I, I think we've made a lot of headway too. I do think that dichotomy or that continuum um, of uh, improvement to accountability is one as one way that has um, kind of limited us. Um, as well as the kind of turnover and churn that you both described. But I do think we've seen increasing sophistication and in understanding student learning and, and how to really capture that authentically. Um, I think new generations of faculty are understanding assessment better in part because maybe they've grown up in a different paradigm. Um, Speaking of paradigms, maybe we are still nudging into the learning paradigm and we still kind of um, have a teaching paradigm happening. Um, but, um, but, I, but I'd like to think that, and I, and I do think that we've made a lot of progress. We certainly have um, leadership now that understands the importance of student learning outcomes and the importance of communicating that broadly. Let's get another another question out there, and uh, uh, I, we're going to wrap up in a bit. But I think that uh, that we do have some time uh, for some more questions right up until about uh, three or four minutes before the hour. So there's a question about when are rankings on various dimensions a quote unquote good proxy for quality? <laughs> you want, you, who, who wants to take that one? <laughs> I'm tempted to say well, I, never. <laughs> I, well, I was going to say that too, but I see I see from whom yeah. that question has come. And so that's yeah. right. We need to take yeah. we need to take Bill Plager's question seriously. Hello, Bill. I agree. Um, that, it is a good question. Uh, I, I don't like it, but it, it's a good question. And, and what what comes to mind may be those uh, those rankings that we now have a lot more of them uh, that are close uh, that are mission fit rankings. So I think of institutions, for example, that pride themselves on preparing people for public service. And so I think it's the Washington Monthly, right, that has come up with, a, with some questions about the number of people going into Peace Corps work and, and volunteering time and so forth and so on. You know, that, that kind of makes sense to me, not necessarily that we're separating wheat from chaff here or, or we're, we're suggesting that uh, one institution is of better quality than another. Uh, but at least it, it provides a frame of reference. Uh, I don't want to use the word benchmarking here, but at least uh, these kinds of uh, uh, templates uh, allow us to talk about what it is we are about and some recognition that we're doing this work relatively well. That's, that's, one, that's my answer for the moment. Yeah, let me chime in as, as well. I, you know, uh, the rankings are interesting, and, and uh, people should be aware if you're not uh, already aware that uh, in outside of this country, uh, rankings are taken very, very seriously, uh, and uh, uh, there there's a whole set of scholarship around rankings. Uh, that uh, that really point to their important importance in uh, surfacing problems to be uh, to be addressed. But I think you know to to riff on you know one of the things that uh, uh, we said before about the unaccompanied number. Beware the unaccompanied ranking. 
uh, because I think that what you really need to do is what's the ba- understand what's the basis of the ranking. How is it? How's it come to that? I mean, I plead guilty uh, to being part of what amounts to a kind of a ranking among states uh, in the measuring up projects uh, uh, that uh, took place between 19, uh, 2000 uh, and 2008, uh, where we ranked states. And uh, th- that was really a set of numbers with a, with a, with a clear agenda uh, that was toward e- empowering uh, underprepared and uh, minority and uh, poorer uh, citizens of the country uh, to uh, uh, to make sure that their needs were attended to. So I think a ranking can be very useful in focusing attention, uh, but uh, but just mindful acceptance of a ranking without probing into what it really means uh, is is a real problem. Mel, and we have all, I was just going to say, we have all sorts of other proxies for quality that are still deeply embedded in our systems and our institutions and our accreditation standards. So, um, you know, it, we still have a lot of work to do around uh, cracking that nut. <laughs> the proxy. Uh, uh, yeah, another question, if, Sarah? Uh, actually, Peter, I think uh, if you're willing, we could maybe begin the wrap up and you could ask for last comments. Uh, I, I actually think that uh, that we've given people a fair amount, uh, the panelists, a fair amount of airtime already. So I think we can take one more question. And we'll wrap up at about uh, five minutes of the hour. Okay. So another question? Have, yes. Another question we have is, what's common across both improvement and accountability Q&A efforts? Maybe decision-making processes, student-level assessments, outcomes, transparency, et cetera. Do you see any opportunities for convergent messaging? Yeah, I, I think that the, the two are coming together a lot. I mean, if I were to write that paper again, 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 uh, I would say that uh, with the emergence of authentic classroom-based uh, uh, learning uh, outcomes uh, evidence uh, and the use of rubrics to judge them and all of that kind of thing, I think we're an awful lot closer uh, to bringing improvement and accountability uh, together than we were uh, 20 years ago when I first started uh, writing about this. Uh, and so I see that is extremely uh, hopeful that uh, that faculty getting the the work that Niloa is doing in constructing good faculty assignments is an is an excellent uh, one as as well as that gets the accountability work fused right into the improvement work at the classroom level. Well, Peter, I'm glad you're willing to write that paper again. So I'm issuing you a formal <laughs> invitation publicly, uh, asking you to do that. Um, I think w- w- one thing that I'm playing with in my mind's eye is, 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 is complicating ourselves. I think we've fallen prey mm. to the notion that we have to provide simple uh, answers to uh, the questions. What, what, and this, this, is, this was a good question. You know, is it, are, are these, what are we, who are we trying uh, to respond to? What are the, and I think we should spend a little bit more time talking about not just uh, arguing the apologizing for how complicated the work is, but actually explaining how complicated the work is, and perhaps not trying to do this at the institutional level, but holding uh, independent uh, I mean, uh, programs uh, uh, accountable and responsible uh, by the institution to articulate what it is they were aiming to do, and then describing with documentation how well they were able to do that with uh, their students. I think we have reached the point where we need to bring it to a close. I want to close with uh, with a, a set of very quick comments. Uh, if we could bring up the next slide. Um, that uh, it, it's often useful to think about this in terms of what assessment is not. Uh, I mean, we, we rather than trying to define things in terms of uh, of what uh, uh, what it is, it's what's off the table. The first one if you can animate that, is not measuring everything that moves. Uh, there was an accreditor that shall remain nameless uh, that at one point was called the, the requirements for institutional effectiveness were called the, uh, uh, the Full Employment Act for Institutional Research. Uh, because their requirements really uh, uh, involved trying to take a look at everything. And what you really need to do is take a look at what's important, what's part of the mission, what's a priority. The second one, 
is not just checking up after the fact. George has already mentioned some of this. It's the learning environment, uh, the things that Nessie will tell us, what the students' motivations are, uh, what the stimulants are, and so on. We need the whole package, not just the, not just the outcomes. Third one, not just searching for final answers. It's struggling to get up there. Um, uh, it, instead, it's the questions that get raised along the, along the way. It's a kind of continuing, as Mel mentioned, continuing spiral of questions that are posed and then answers and then or partial answers. That stimulates new questions uh, and so on. So we really uh, are, uh, are, are in this uh, as much as anything in an inquiry mode, not a final answer thing. The fourth one, and this kind of is the antidote, if you will, to the uh, 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 the dominance of, of technique that we mentioned as being part of the accountability approach. It's not always being as precise as possible. Uh, it, it, there's in so we we tend to emulate the social scientific uh, kind of 0.05 level of significance, uh, a standard of truth. Well, truth is really a lot more complicated than that, and it depends an awful lot uh, on the question. And so it's being as precise as necessary, as precise as we need to be in answering the question that's uh, that's posed. Uh, this is an old one, uh, but it's, it's sort of engraved at the, on the walls at NCHEMS, but uh, that we have a, uh, a saying uh, that uh, the, one of the problems with higher education is that we tend to measure things with a micrometer, mark it with chalk, and cut it with an ax. Uh, that the actual decisions that we have to make need le much less precise information uh, than uh, than the methodologies uh, will sometimes demand. So think very much about where you are in the decisions you have to make uh, about the uh, the level of precision you need to. And then the final one is really, uh, and it's not terribly reassuring, is not expe not ever expecting to be done. That this stuff is never finished, and it's that, as Mel said, constant uh, spiral. Uh, where new questions come up and uh, and so on, uh, just like scholarship uh, it itself. And that is, just to uh, draw this to a close, uh, it underlines uh, the validity of our title, Quality Never Goes Out of Style. All right. Sally? Yeah. Hey, thanks so much. Um, and thank all of you for participating in this third of our 50th anniversary webinars. Our next one is going to be on July 12th, and it's featuring Sarah Torres Lugo and her guests, Alvin Schnecksider and Paul Dussal, as they look at an examination of the work to change campus cultures to eliminate equity gaps and increase student success. And please go to the NCHEMS website to register. Now, this webinar will be archived at nchems.org, and we encourage you to share that link with others that you think might enjoy it. Finally, thank you, Peter, George Koo, and Melanie Booth, for sharing your expertise and your time. Thank you. Thank you.